Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Uh, this is the first time I've done the podcast in my office, and you can see a, a great uh, naval portrait there in the background and um, bookshelves. And, and joining me from the other end of the fourth deck here in Beach Hall is my counterpart and colleague, uh, Mr. Dennis Clift, who... Uh, there's Dennis, and he's in his office at the other end of uh, the fourth deck here at Beach Hall at the Naval Institute. Um, and we're looking out our windows today, although you can't see it uh, from your perspective as viewers. Uh, we're looking out on the uh, Canadian forest fire haze. Uh, it feels Annapolis feels a bit like uh, Los Angeles, maybe circa 1978, with uh, some tremendous smog and very poor uh, air quality today. So. Uh, we're all inside with air filters on and uh, trying to make the best of uh, of a very of a code purple, which I'd never heard of before. The D.C. mayor declared it a code purple air quality day uh, here in the D.C. region. So, uh, Dennis, uh, welcome to the show. Great to have you back on. Thank you very much, Bill. My pleasure. Uh, so I'll remind our, our uh, guests and our listeners that um, the uh, Proceedings podcast is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873. Uh, this is our 150th year. The members of the Naval Institute have provided the foundation for everything we do, from proceedings to Naval History Magazine to USNI News to the events and conferences that we do uh, to also uh, supporting and buying uh, the books that the uh, Naval Institute Press produces. Uh, so if you're not a member of the Naval Institute, uh, you can become one at usni.org forward slash join. Uh, and if you are a member, please encourage your shipmates, your fellow Marines, your colleagues and family members to become a member. Uh, start receiving proceedings and discounts on all the things that we do and, and be a foundational sort of brick in the wall, if you will, of, uh, of what the Naval Institute does. Um, so back to Dennis for a minute. Um, some of you might remember a couple of months ago, we did a, an episode with Dennis. We were talking about uh, former President Jimmy Carter and Dennis's experiences on the National Security Council, working for then Vice President Fritz Mondale and things that were happening uh, in the lead up uh, and the culmination of the um, of the uh, Arab or sorry, the Israeli Egyptian peace accords in the 1973 uh, Camp David Accords. And Dennis was there. What, say it again. 17. <laughs> Excuse me. 19, yes. 19, 1978. I said 73. 1978 uh, Egyptian Israeli peace accords. And Dennis was there uh, as, as uh, part of the team, the White House team, the National Security Council team uh, at Camp David for that uh, um, groundbreaking uh, uh, peace accord. Anyway, uh, Dennis is back on the show today to talk about two things. Uh, so, Dennis um, has been writing for us for our 150th anniversary year. He's been writing the heritage sections of each issue of proceedings. So we've gone back and looked at our history uh, on topics of interest each month. So January was surface warfare. So Dennis researched 150 years worth of, of naval weapons development, which primarily started in the surface community back in the, in the day. Um, and then in, uh, you know, March was our Naval Review, and he looked at, um, you know, how we've uh, approached uh, high-level major events in the history of the Navy over the last 150 years. And in the May issue, which was our annual International Navy's Focus, Dennis went back and looked at 150 years of the topic of allies and partners and how it's been covered in proceedings. Um, so, Dennis, uh, this was another just a great job. You've gone back and you found quotes and, and excerpts from proceedings articles. And I'm, I'm, I, I noted uh, the, the sort of synergy, uh, if you will, in this one, because you start off uh, with a piece that talks about the Yorktown campaign and how the United States uh, at that time, the 13 colonies, we owe in, in many ways our independence to the alliance that we had and the assistance that the French Navy brought to us uh, in that war for independence. So uh, start us off there with the piece uh, written in the 1931 uh, article of proceedings. Well, 
The um, role of the French in the Revolutionary War was so incredibly important. Um, and, you know, many people see the proceedings as focused on the U.S. Navy, its weapons, its electronics, its personnel, the Marine Corps, similar issues, Coast Guard, similar issues. The proceedings is much, much more. And this Allies and Partners article addresses war, it addresses deterring war, and it's a history of major world de developments, um, 19th century, 20th century, and now into the 21st century, um, starting with um, Washington, the underdog, co co the colonies fighting against the British, and the British on the move in 1778. They had taken over Philadelphia, and um, Washington just knew he needed naval support. And out of French ports sailed Admiral d'Estaing with 17 warships. And as word of the arriving French fleet reached the British, they abandoned Philadelphia and retreated to New York. Um, just an amazing story. Um, they knew they were up there at the head of the, head of the Delaware. And in those days, you depended on river transport for supplies and for equipment to get to your people. And they knew they would just be trapped up there. And so they retreated to New York and then move ahead to 1781. And you have the French fleet, this time more than one French admiral, battling Cornwallis in the battle off the Virginia Capes, which led to the French keeping the British from resupplying their troops in Virginia and which led to the end of the war, the Yorktown surrender of the British. It's just amazing history and we have it here in the proceedings with um, very, very talented authors writing on it. Thank you. Yeah, including one of those talented authors is uh, at the time Navy Captain Dudley Knox who, who wrote, the mere probability of the coming of Destang's fleet, like some invisible gigantic hand, had pulled greatly superior British army out of the perfect security of Philadelphia and sent it scurrying on forced marches across New Jersey. So anyway, it's not just the stories, but also who wrote the story. So in this case, uh, Dudley Knox was one. And then you move uh, ahead into uh, the 19th, 20th century. In 1927, looking back, um, um, on, on the Boxer Rebellion, Navy Captain J.K. Tossig uh, wrote an article about his experience as a midshipman at the end of the 19th century uh, in China and in the Boxer Rebellion. So tell that story a little bit. Well, Joe Tausig was a midshipman, as you say, and um, the U.S. and European nations were very concerned that the Chinese, the boxers in China, were trying to expel U.S. commercial interests and to get rid of our diplomatic establishment. And so we sent eight nations, including the U.S., ashore um, and marched um, on the Chinese. And Taosig was part of that march. He was wounded in it. Um, and um, then he would look back on that Oh, 26, 27 years later in the proceedings, at the same time that he was about to play a major, major role in World War I. Right. So uh, I could pick up there if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up. Well, I want to I just want to point out that the uh, the CEO suite, um, our boss is uh, Admiral Daly's suite here at the Naval Institute is called the Joe Tossig suite. Right. So there's this. Um, intermixture of midshipman Tossig and then later on writing about uh, the Boxer Rebellion and his experiences in that. Uh, as you say, he's getting ready to play a major, a significant role 
in um, in World War One, and then he goes on later. He writes a, a piece called "Destroyer Experiences During the Great War." So, talk about that the, about that piece. You know, let let me just put a footnote. Um, the CEO suite here is actually named for Joe Tausig Jr., um, who so, was Admiral Tausig's son, and who in fact lost a leg aboard the Utah in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and did the amazing feat of moving on a career from lieutenant to captain on one leg and persuading the surgeons and the medical officers giving us physic, physical that he was just fine. Um, and so he hopped ahead through a, a remarkable career. But um, Tausig Sr. Um, was given orders by the Secretary of the Navy to sail to Great Britain to join the British um, to assist them. And the, his job, he, he led a squadron of six destroyers over through incredibly violent weather. And his job was one, to help protect convoys and two, to hunt submarines. And in these articles, he wrote three articles in the proceedings, in fact, on these, on how they did it and then um, what it was like toward the end um, when they also had a home base in France. We come full circle to another relationship with France. And, and at that time, uh, Tossig also developed a relationship with Admiral Sims, correct? Um, he had a relationship, um, as I remember, uh, let, let's go back um, to this um, World War I. When he had been in the Boxer Rebellion and when he had been in the hospital, um, the future chief of the Royal Navy staff was on a bed beside him and um, they became buddies. And now here he is sailing six destroyers over to join and the chief of the Royal Navy staff said, I'm certain um, things are gonna go very nice, nicely. And when Tausig called on the um, British high command in Belfast, um, where, the, where they then arrived, he was asked, when, you, when will you and your ships be ready to sail? They had come through this violent North Atlantic passage and um, Tausig said, ready when fuel, sir, sir, ready when fuel, sir, which I thought is one of the great, um, I think that may be up on the wall somewhere in Bancroft Hall, um, Naval Academy. It's just one of the great quotes. Yeah, sounds very familiar. Um, there's also a, an article that you cite here, a 1929 proceedings article by Coast Guard Captain uh, William Wheeler, looking back, reflecting on World War I, his, his experiences, and the article was titled Reminiscence, Reminiscences of World War I Convoy Work. Uh, so it wasn't just Navy folks writing uh, for proceedings about the international system of convoys for the Great War uh, but also uh, a Coast Guard officer as well. Tell, tell a little bit about that. Well, e exactly. Um, and the, the Coast Guard was very, very active um, as a junior partner to the Navy um, in protecting these convoys. And he writes with great detail. I might jump ahead just a bit to, to one more example of Coast Guard officers writing um, on these subjects. Um, World War II, Operation Torch. We had entered the war and we had decided to put forces ashore um, in North Africa. And another Coast Guard officer wrote a wonderful piece on what it was like to help be in a huge convoy taking these troops overseas. And then the horrible situation they faced being new to this business of putting troops ashore um, when they would land the U.S. Army troops in small boats and then trying to pull the small boats back off the beach would be smashed up on the beach again by surf. The boats would be destroyed. And that was part of the learning of amphibious warfare and Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Army, all involved in this together. As an alliance effort, not, you know, not just a, a U.S. effort, but you point that out as well. And that was Coast Guard, future Coast Guard Commandant 
uh, Merlin O'Neill, who was commanding uh, the, the Navy transport USS Leonard Wood in that uh, Operation Torch. So think about that for a second. A, a Coast Guard, at that time he was a commander of World War II, later the commandant of the Coast Guard, but he had command of a U.S. Navy ship uh, at the time. So um, interesting. We're, we're talking these days about, you know, much tighter and, and better integration between the Coast Guard of the Navy and the Marine Corps, all three of the sea services in current day and in future possible operations if, uh, you know, contingency in the, in, uh, the Western Pacific. Uh, and, and there you have a great example of how the Coast Guard in its wartime mission, Coast Guard officers commanding U.S. Navy ships. Well, exactly. And, um, you know, that tradition continues. Um, now we have, you know, the Coast Guard um, engaged in various high level issues um, in areas of key importance to the U.S. in the Pacific and elsewhere. Um, this evolving role of the different sea services is so important not to exclude the Marine Corps, which is critical um, to so much of this, particularly the amphibious warfare. Um, there, there was one other moment here um, that the article mentions, and that was in 1941, before the U.S. entered the war, World War II, President FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, secretly left Washington on apparently a pleasure cruise on his royal yacht, his, his presidential yacht, forgive me. And um, when he got off Cape Cod, um, he secretly transferred to the cruiser at Augusta. And then the presidential yacht continued through the Cape Cod Canal and along near the shoreline. And they had dressed up a member of the yacht's crew as FDR, complete with the cigarette holder and the cigarette, so that people would see the president, whereas the president was actually steaming north to Argentia. But at that Argentia conference, we were not in the war, but we were, Roosevelt was determined to work with the British, even though the US did not want to enter the war, Roosevelt had begun production lines in the United States for weapon systems and Roosevelt and Churchill signed what would be known as the Atlantic Charter, a broad statement of what we hope would come out of this battle against Nazi Germany. Um, and the, these, the, the article just captures these different moments um, in this amazing international history. Yeah, and this was uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison who uh, wrote in the Battle of the Atlantic uh, if Mr. Churchill expected to commit the United States to war, he was unsuccessful. Uh, but but he, Mr. Roosevelt succeeded in committing the prime minister to a policy which would commend itself to American ways of thinking and satisfy the doubters of British sincerity and quiet those who are asking, what are we going to fight for? I, I love that. Um, there's another part, uh, back to World War II in the Pacific, uh, you've got, you, you quote an article by a retired Royal Australian Navy commander, E.A. Felt, who in 1961 was writing about the Coast Watchers in World War II. And I thought that was interesting that not, just, not only um, the Coast Watching operations, but also uh, from the Australian perspective. What, what, what kinds of things did uh, Commander Felt have to say? Well, you know, the Australians were playing this vitally important role of having these lone souls on islands here and there in the Pacific spotting Japanese naval movements and letting us know what was going on. These were our eyes forward. The, this was intelligence in those days. There were no satellites. Yeah, this was, uh, this was ISR in 1941, right? This was right? ISR. Yeah. And the Australians and the Coast Watchers played a major part in this. Great example. Uh, so then after World War II, you already mentioned the Atlantic Charter, but we go into the United, United Nations and we get into uh, NATO uh, and a lot of this uh, alliance work for that would that would really you know, set up the rubric under which we operate. We and our allies operated against the Soviet Union yep. during the, the Cold War. Right. The ground rules were changing. 
Um, and um, Ambassador Robert McClintock wrote a wonderful piece in um, the mid 1940s in the proceedings um, on the new United Nations and on UN Security Council resolutions um, endorsing um, military actions, if you will, where the UN Security Council saw that appropriate. And of course, it was under Security Council resolution that the US moved into Korea to expel North Korea from South Korea in the Korean War. And um, this, this was um, just a whole new chapter, but then you mentioned NATO. And in 1949, um, Vice Admiral Gerald Wright wrote a great piece on something called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Um, and he talked about the fact, he said, now for the first time, the US has officially ended its policy of no entangling alliances. He said, NATO is an alliance in which we are totally caught up in. And he said, NATO depends on the US and on cargoes and on personnel and on ships in the Atlantic the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And he just talked about the importance of this whole new um, chapter to us. And talking on about this in 1954, we had another um, author write on the creation of another regional um, alliance, CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, because we, and the uh, Australians and the French and the New Zealanders, the Thailanders, the Philippines, the UK were dedicated to halting communist aggression in Southeast Asia. And so the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was established. And then if I may continue, um, that was mid fifties, you move up to 1960 and you have an, an incredibly important action between the United States and Japan. President Eisen, this is re reported in the proceedings, President Eisenhower met with Prime Minister Kishi and they signed the US-Japan Treaty on Mutual Cooperation and Security. And this was back, way back in 1960. And that's probably as important or more important today than it was more than 40 years ago when they signed it, um, because it gave the United States, our Navy, our Air Force, our Army, rights to um, <clears throat> land bases, land es establishments in um, Japan and Japanese possessions. And, you know, today we have ships home ported in Japanese ports. Um, this has continued and is crucially important to US security today, but the proceedings I mentioned, you know, let, let me back up one more bit. Way back um, <clears throat> for 14 years, I was head of the intelligence college of the United States Department of Defense. And I am today the president emeritus of the National Intelligence University. And if I were talking to my faculty today, my political science faculty, my history, I'd say, have your students read this article because in eight pages, it gives them an incredibly concise view of what was going on in the world and why it is such important. Why it's so important that we study history at the same time that we're looking forward. And this of course was a point that proceedings authors from Alfred Thayer Mahan on moves that we have to understand history if we're going to understand what we do in the future. Yeah, that's a great point, Dennis. Uh, you can never never make that point too many times, right? And uh, as you point out, you know, in all of these discussions, you know, the last two iterations of the national security strategy, a, a major tenet of both 2018 and, and the 2022 national security or national defense strategies have had, um, you know, the, the, the importance of alliances and partnerships is, is paramount. It's one of the three major 
um, you know, tenets of the national defense strategy. So as you point out, it was, you know, 1960, uh, that mutual treaty of mutual cooperation and security between the U.S. and Japan signed by President Eisenhower and Prime Minister Kishi. And there's a great picture of the two of them there, you know, shaking hands outside the White House. Um, move Can forward. You, Go ahead. Let's move forward to 1990-91. You've got a great article in the proceedings by one of our wonderful authors and senior members, Vice Admiral Robert Dunn, on um, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And um, it was UN Security Council resolutions that gave us the platform on which we built a coalition and moved in and kicked Iraq's Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And um, that was so important, but it was reported in the proceedings and there would be many, many articles on that, all of the different dimensions of Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And then of course, we jump forward to 2001 and the attack by terrorists hijacking US civilian airliners, attack on the World Trade Centers, attack on the Pentagon, attempted fourth attack, which was foiled by heroic passengers, which forced that plane to crash and lost their lives in the process. But the proceedings had a great piece by Marine Commandant James Jones on the fact that this was the first time when NATO said, we will get involved with the US in going after those who attacked the United States, Osama bin Laden, and um, his cohorts in Afghanistan, this was the first time NATO had invoked Article 5. And Article 5 says an attack on one NATO member is an attack on all NATO members. And this saw several NATO members join us in these actions in Afghanistan. Yeah, so back to your point of, uh, earlier about encumbering alliances, that encumbering alliance uh, established, you know, NATO in, in uh, the 19, what, 50. Uh, and then the first time, as you point out, first time that uh, Article 5 was invoked was uh, in, in to benefit the United States after the 9-11 years later, you know. Yeah. Um, then th there's a section here on page uh, 72 and 73 where you, you look at, uh, as, as we've had, and, and it's in this issue, the May issue, uh, every year for years now, we've had the commanders respond or the international commanders respond. And that is, uh, it's usually at the end of the, the previous year, uh, we send a letter to the chiefs of all the international navies and coast guards around the world, all of them, uh, including the Russians, the Chinese, our adversaries, our friends and allies and, and uh, neutral countries. And we ask them uh, to answer a question. It, it's generally focused around the security challenges that their nation is facing in the maritime domain. Uh, and it can be, you know, how are you developing your force? It can be what's the biggest threat to your, merit, your nation's maritime security? Uh, but it's, you know, sort of the, the flavor is that. And you've pulled out going back to all the way to, to 1992, um, that this was the, uh, the Admiral Dick Borjesson, Royal Swedish Navy, answering a question, how do changes in the superpower relationship affect the future of your Navy? So uh, read Admiral Borjesson's uh, response, and then they've got a couple others there as well. Well, yes, and, you know, it, it's fun to track all of that. Um, this is from the 1980s on that the Naval Institute Proceedings has had an international Navy's issue, and these wonderful commanders respond sections are in each issue. But um, just w after um, the Soviet Union collapsed and Boris Yeltsin took over, we started having some very good responses from very, very high level Russian naval officers. And now this may not surprise you, um, with Putin in power, um, that has stopped. Um, we don't hear much now from um, the Russian Navy. Um, but um, down through the years, we have this incredible flow of very, very important senior officers looking at the world from their Navy's perspective and from their region's perspective. And the proceedings, is it? Yep. 
Um, so Dennis, uh, terrific work again on this section of the, uh, the, you know, the heritage article, allies and partners in the May issue. Um, we're looking forward to, you know, right now we're working on the July issue of proceedings, which is an aviation focused and our, uh, our, our attentive readers will remember that last year you went back and looked at a hundred years of carrier aviation. And that was in, um, in response to the tailhook, uh, symposiums focus on 100 years of carrier aviation. And so this year, the July issue, we're going to have um, essentially 150 years uh, or, or, or as long back as proceedings has covered aviation topics um, with a less focus on carrier aviation, more of a focus on helicopters and maritime patrol and dirigibles and other other forms of naval aviation over the years. So that's just a teaser for what's coming in the July issue. Uh, but now I wanna take a, a couple minutes and, and congratulate you and also talk a little bit about, um, because our listeners know that this is our 150th year and Dennis is the author of this amazing book just coming out from the Naval Institute Press, The Pen and the Sword, the US Naval Institute, 1873 to 2023. So Dennis, we've been watching you here in Beach Hall, writing and editing and editing and writing and adding and finding pictures for this book. I think it, you started on it maybe five years ago, right? Four or five years ago, indeed. Um, and um, it's, it's, to me, it's a valuable book. Okay, I wrote it, but I think it's valuable because the book captures the writings of young and un unknown officers. It captures famous flag and general officers, US and foreign authors who have published in the proceedings, Naval Institute books and oral histories um, down through the years. And this is their prime history because what I did, my approach to bringing these 17 chapters to life was to let them tell the story through their vantage points at different points in their careers. And we have articles, amazing articles by Lieutenant Ernest King in 1909, um, Lieutenant Chester Nimitz in 1912, um, future fleet admirals writing as um, lieutenants on how to better organize um, ships in King's Place and how to um, the, the, the submarine as a weapon of modern warfare and what a valuable, valuable role it's going to play. And then you have other lieutenants, um, Lieutenant Hyman Rickover, the future Admiral of the Nuclear Navy writing in the mid 1930s um, on international law and the submarine. Um, this is all letting their tell the story. You know, Nimitz writing about submarines um, says they're going to do a great job, but he said one of the things we have to do, and he's just writing as a lieutenant, he had had submarine duty, um, and um, he said one of the important things we have to do is to get rid of gasoline engines in our submarines, um, because gasoline down in that engine room, <clears throat> when you're steaming submerged, um, very quickly creates fumes that cause the engineers to get toxically drunk, to become violent. The gasoline fumes, before they pass out, they start thrashing around and swinging at things. And he said, we had to lash them down. We had to, and he said, we have to stop that. We have to move to the diesel powered engine. And of course he was so <clears throat> um, brilliantly um, perceptive, but I have note one other, um, Nimitz footnote, um, on his way up the line in the late 1920s as a captain, he was the first commanding officer of the first NROTC unit at Berkeley, California at Cal. And he wrote on the value of NROTC as he saw it. And he said, I think the nation will be very pleased. Um, and so you have these authors down through the years um, making these incredibly valuable contributions, and then going on to marvelous, um, marvelous positions. And Dennis, you also in your in the book you highlight 
uh, some of the other big programs uh, that the Naval Institute does, but our events and conferences, you highlight our, our oral histories, you highlight some of the uh, the key books that we've published over the years. You know, you mentioned the Blue Jackets manual for one, and that for now uh, over 100 years, the, the Blue Jackets manual has been published by the Naval Institute and put in the hands of every new sailor who joins the U.S. Navy. So just talk about a little bit of some of the things off off uh, focus from proceedings, you know, naval history or the press or the books or the events and conferences that are noteworthy in our 150 years. The Naval Institute Press um, is a charter member of the University Presses of America. It's a very important press and it publishes <clears throat> important books. And um, down through the years, as you say, we the first edition of the Blue Jackets manual was leather bound and it was designed, it had a flap that could be snapped closed and it was designed to sit fit into a sailor's pocket. The size was designed to fit in the sailor's pocket. And that Blue Jackets manual is now in its 26th edition and going strong. Um, and then um, a few years later, shall we say, the Naval Institute, had the press had not been interested in fiction, but they suddenly came across a guy sort of knocking on the door of Preble Hall, where we used to be as the Naval Institute here in the Academy grounds. And he was a guy trying to publish a book and he had been rejected by New York publishers. And he said, would you give this a read? And we did. And we had a very talented editor who did some work on it. And it went on to be published by the Naval Institute Press. It was The Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy. And my heavens, you know, that launched him on a mega, mega, mega career, created beautiful movie. And this got us into a broader field <clears throat> of publishing. But we have an, also, we have the oral history program. And in the 1960s, um, we took the decision. We said, if we're going to really have a good archive, we should have the first person recollections of those who served. And we brought down a very talented individual from um, Columbia University, um, uh, Reverend John Mason, I believe his name was, and he created the oral history program at the Naval Institute. And today we have more than 250 of these oral histories they could be ordered from the Naval Institute, but they are such tremendous reading um, by people <clears throat> from um, flag admirals down to Master Chief Diver Carl Brashear, the first Navy black um, master diver, um, his oral history. And these are such an, a marvelous addition to what it is that we make available to our membership and the public far more broadly. Yeah, and, and those oral histories are often uh, a key endnote, if you will, or a key resource for people who are doing uh, deep historical work on the U.S. Navy. So uh, historians come here, they, they read the oral histories, they listen uh, to those particular leaders uh, talk about events in their careers and in their time in the Navy uh, and then those become the basis of a lot of the uh, the historical work that sometimes in proceedings and and but more often uh, quoted in books that the Naval Institute Press or other presses publish on major events in the history of the USC services. So we have on file we have on file the um, recordings, um, the tapes um, with these authors. And those can be listened to, um, you know, if you are a member or if you want to come in and work with us. Um, but the, it, it's just so wonderful. Um, I remember one of Arlie Burke's great contributions was um, as a young officer, he was um, he helped to put together an amphibious landing down. I believe it was off Cuba. We were just trying to learn how to do this. And as a very young officer, he was put in charge 
of the various boats from the various ships that were um, taking the troops ashore at some point. And he'd have them lying off the, um, he'd have them lying off the uh, ships and he'd shut down the engines on these boats so as not to waste fuel. And then he had the worst time in the world with many of the coxswains unable to get their engines started at the key moment when they're lying out there. And one of his sailors came up to him and said, sir, this is to young officer Burke. He said, if I may suggest, why don't you keep the engines running and just <laughs> have them circle, just have the boat circle. And Burke says, that was my contribution to amphibious warfare. <laughs> <laughs> a young officer listening to his uh, his petty officer. Brilliant, That's brilliant great. stuff. Yeah. Well, Dennis, we are out of time, but I want to thank you again for writing the Heritage articles in the proceedings every month this this year. And so uh, we were talking about allies and partners in the May issue, which was terrific. And then we were talking about your book, our book, our history, the pen and the sword, Naval Institute, eighteen seventy three to twenty twenty three, and it is available. You can find it and buy your copy. Uh, on our website, go to usni.org forward slash books press uh, and just type in the pen and the sword and it'll come up and uh, and you can order a copy today. It is it is available for sale now and um, uh, very excited to have that book out and just, on the streets. Just look at the back issue of the current proceedings. The whole back cover is an ad for the pen an and the sword. Court. That's right. Yep. That's right. Well, Dennis, congratulations again. And um uh, we'll have to have you on the show later, maybe later this year to talk about another one of your heritage sections, or we'll do a, another oral history uh, uh, version of the podcast with you as we get closer to 9 October, our 150th anniversary. And that, by the way, for our listeners, is going to be a gala-like, we're not calling it a gala, but a gala-like event, a big event here at our headquarters on 9 October on the actual 150th anniversary of the founding of the Naval Institute. And it is open to the public. It's, it's a, a little bit of a pricey event, but there is a deep discount for active duty people and a discount for members of the Naval Institute. Uh, but it'll be an event, a party, a celebration that people will not want to miss. So a, a great event coming up on the 9th of October. Mark your calendars. Okay, well, that wraps up another episode of the proceedings. Oh, well, Dennis, you got one more thing. Just remember. The correct word for 150th anniversary is sesquicentennial. Sesquicentennial. You don't, get, you don't get to say that often. Right. Absolutely. No. We've been saying it a lot, but most every 150 know. years. Every 150 years. Yes. Good point. Well, that thank wraps you, up. Bill. Thank, thanks for the invitation. And thank you for working with me, inviting me to write these Heritage art articles. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's, it's a lot of it work. Is. It is, it is yeoman's work. You've gone back and read literally 150 years worth of proceedings to find the tidbits and the excerpts from all these articles. And you've listened to oral histories and you've also included some of the Naval Institute Press uh, books in them. Not, it hasn't just been focused on proceedings. And so they are, they are a terrific addition. And for our members, um, this is an addition. So a normal issue of proceedings is 96 pages. And we made we added an extra eight pages to every issue for the our 150th anniversary. So this is, most of these issues are now 104 pages to add Dennis's eight page uh, heritage section. So uh, great stuff. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for doing that. Thank you. All right, well, until next week, remember victory begins at the Naval Institute. And if you are not a member of the Naval Institute, please become one, go to usni.org forward slash join, become a member, Tell your friends and shipmates and fellow Marines and Coast Guardsmen to join the Institute and to uh, listen to the podcast. Uh, tune in. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Thank you.